Well, hello and welcome to this edition of Between Two Sundays. My name is Jeff Rendell. I'm the associate pastor at Meadowcroft Presbyterian Church, and I'm joined by our senior pastor, Max Benfer. Max, how are you doing today? Doing well. Thank you. Good. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing pretty well. I'm doing pretty well, getting ready to, to preach this week uh, for Palm yeah. Sunday. So looking forward to that. And, uh, you know, the weather's a little bit better today, although it's incredibly windy. In fact, I just looked out and we have two little soccer nets in the backyard. And I, I don't know where one of them is right now. So <laughs> oh, man. my, my <laughs> mission after this is to find yeah. the soccer net. So God. I might, might end up meeting some neighbors in a very yeah. way. But. <laughs> So, but yeah, it's good. It's good to see you, uh, yeah. as always. And uh, uh, wanted to, you know, again, just emphasize kind of why we're doing this. I mean, you and I are separated, but even more than that, our whole, our whole church is right now. And this is just uh, a way for us to to communicate with the church, to talk about uh, some things that are going on at the church, to talk about our Sunday services, our sermons, and things like that. And so, uh, we're just thankful for the technology, you know, to be able to to do this and. Uh, wanted to jump in and talk a little bit about uh, last week's uh, service, which mm -hmm. was the least people we've had so far uh, in the, in the sanctuary. We just had, had a few folks uh, right. in there. We just had Eric uh, on the music. Did it seem like it was the sparsest one to you being in there? Yeah, it was, it was kind of almost felt ominous, you know, even though, even though, you know, the, the sparseness was, was on purpose uh, but still just uh each week has dwindled <laughs> so yeah. to have uh have it down to that you know small amount was uh was was really kind of weird but um but you know i i've been telling people as i'd speak to them on the phone it is good having the the streaming going on right at that moment because i think that that's really helped me to preach um i think if, if it was a pre-recorded thing that uh that, that i was just kind of trying to act out a sermon knowing that the only the only one listening to me was my computer screen it would be way different and i think have knowing that a lot of people are probably on right then has helped me i think to 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 be a little bit feel a little bit more normal than, than usual so i'm glad we're doing it that way yeah no that makes sense um i did we did get a couple questions uh on uh the sermon i'm not sure if the people want me to share who it's from. So if you're watching this and it's your question, uh, I won't, I won't mention your name, but, <laughs> but uh, here, here they are. Here, here's the first one. Uh, and this question is uh, about John eight fifty seven, which was part of the passage last week where the Jews said to Jesus, you are not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham. And the question is, is there any thought that maybe Jesus was closer to 50 than the age usually attributed to him? It always seemed odd to me that they say he's not yet 50 if he is 30. They would probably refer to his age being 30, not 50. So I wanted to ask, you know, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Is, is there a, a question that maybe Jesus was older? or what, what are your, What's your thinking there? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I, I never, um, just growing up reading that passage, I, I never really thought that. Um, I just assumed they were, kind of quoting a, a phrase that was that was around in the day and, and it was interesting as I studied the passage most New Testament scholars uh kind of agree that it was just an idiom of the day that that referred to like someone being quote 50 uh was someone who who had reached old age at that time because 50 was was basically old uh by, by then so um I actually think you know just um thinking about it now um I kind of think that that they were pressing home their point. Like, so let's say Jesus would, well, first of all, the Bible says Jesus was 30. Like if you read Luke, uh, Luke 3, it says Jesus began his um, ministry, he was around 30. So so that would be contradicting scripture if it if he was really more, more like 50. Mm -hmm. But if he looked 50 rather than looked 30, um, it would almost contradict their point. Like I think their point that they're getting at is, you're you're still a youngster like remember that he's right. saying i abraham saw my day and they're saying you're not even close to being old enough to have ever seen Abraham. you're not even yet 50 i think they're trying to contradict his claim and so given that he is only 30 they're saying you're not yet an old man and so i think to say well hey maybe maybe he looked closer to 50 actually would be the, the opposite point that they were making i mean i think he 
he was 30, he was around 30, scripture yeah. tells us. And I think that that's what they're, that's the point they're getting at is you're not yet an old man. And yet you, you say you've seen Abraham, you know, so. Right. I think that they, they were pressing home that point, actually. Yeah, which I think fits in with so much of what we've seen recently in John is is just that conflict over authority and who, mm -hmm. who has authority and things like that. And uh, Leah Morris, one of those commentators, he pointed out, uh, reminded me that, you know, 50 was the age when Levites could retire. So that was kind of like a, yeah, that was like a marker A 50 year old was like, that was, that was a marker of kind of like we joke about, oh, you're 40, you're over the hill, you know, that it's almost like a similar similar uh, thing where somebody has more credibility when they're at that age of 50 That's and they're right. able to. So that makes sense. Uh, the other question, um, again, I won't mention, I, I did get permission, but I won't mention the whole name, but we'll just call her Catherine R. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she asked about the Nicene Creed. Uh, she said, we said the Nicene Creed on Sunday and said, we affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. What does this mean? When I say the Nicene Creed, I am always reminded of my Catholic friend who also says the Nicene Creed in her Catholic church. She views baptism differently than we do, and it sounds like the Nicene Creed agrees with the Catholic understanding of baptism. Does it? And what do we mean in affirming one baptism for the forgiveness of sins? Now, I know baptism is like kind of your, your wheelhouse, Max, so, you know, I'll, 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 I'll let you start on this one. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that First of all, it's a good question. Um, I think that uh, that it's probably something that, that a number of people in our church wonder um, uh, or have wondered. And um, one of the things I think, too, is we say in the creed that one Catholic church. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we, it's, that's another good, good thing to talk about. And I think, you know, at the time that the Nicene Creed was written, um, if you just read church historians, they'll, they'll, they'll point out that there was by no means a universal understanding that baptism uh of, of say baptismal regeneration that 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 when a child was baptized uh it regenerated that like that was that was pretty much a universally believed thing like around the you know, medieval church but when the nicene creed was written there were some that believed that some that didn't but i think um the more important point uh is that i don't think the nicene creed was was mainly arguing the person of Christ. Like the reason that came together is because of the debate over who is Jesus? Is he God or not? Or is he a created being? And the Nicene Creed really zeroes in on that. And I think by the time you get to the end of it, what it's really doing is not arguing one position of baptism or another. It's really just stating basically what scripture states in, in succinct form. If you read scripture, uh, in Mark and, and then later in Acts, uh, when John the Baptist comes on the scene, he says, repent and be baptized all of you for the forgiveness of sins. And then later Peter says the same thing, repent and be baptized all of you for the forgiveness of sins. And so I think, and then, you know, Paul in Ephesians, like one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God mm -hmm. and Father of all. So I think the, what, what the Nicene Creed is doing rather than making some argument for baptismal regeneration it's really just making a creedal statement of the christian faith that we have one baptism in the father son and holy spirit and scripture says that that one baptism is for the forgiveness of sins not for and so we we can i think very um in good conscience recite it because it wasn't arguing for baptismal regeneration i don't believe and um we do believe that baptism is the sign uh, of the covenant of the new covenant uh, and if you just even read our Reformed Confessions, it talks about how it it signifies our engrafting into Christ, our union with Christ, and and all that that signifies remission of sins and and regeneration and all of that. And and uh, but of course, the sign doesn't equal the thing signified. So we, we're not baptizing a child, saying like all that has been given to them yet, but that when they come to faith, if they do then everything that that sign promises will be true in them. So, but that's a good question. I, I don't know if, do, do you think that's, yeah, those I, are my thoughts on it. Yeah, I think that's helpful. And I was thinking about it and, and reading about it a little bit. And I think, you know, a, a Catholic person could also uh, affirm the Nicene Creed in good conscience according to what they believe. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because we would have different understandings of passages like Acts 238. 
like yeah. you said, that that is exactly, you know, the wording is the same uh, from Scripture. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. of your sins is what Acts 2.38 says. And I think you just kind of nailed it that uh, we would we would understand that passage. We would understand Scripture differently. And, and so I think we just mean uh, our Catholic friends, our Catholic neighbors would mean something different when they affirm that's something right. in the Nicene Creed than we do because they understand scripture differently. That's right. But both of us could recite it in good conscience because that wasn't the point. It was like, like we couldn't recite in good conscience the, the Council of Trent. Right. Because of what it specifically, because of what it argues, you know. But so, yeah, but I think we can both recite the Nicene Creed in, in good faith. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's hopefully, uh, hopefully Catherine R uh, has her question answered there. If not, I, I might hear from her. Uh, yeah. We'll see. I talk to her occasionally. So, <laughs> <laughs> so now might be a, a, a good time uh, to talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, in, in the week to come with Palm Sunday and Easter, yeah. if that's all right. Sure. Um, and so you and I uh, talked, uh, it's just such a unique season, you know, and Palm Sunday uh, on one level and Easter at a whole nother level and Good Friday in a different way uh, are such special times of, of gathering together as a church family. Obviously, we can't do that right now. Um, and so there, there's thoughts out there, and I, I think there are some churches, I don't think there's a lot, but I think there's at least a few churches that are saying, you know what? We're going to wait to celebrate Easter until we're back together again. And I understand that. I want to get your thoughts, but, you know, you understand that on one level because, boy, that's going to be such a joyous time, you know, that time we can come back together and really experience that, 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 that new resurrection life uh, together after being apart uh, for so long. But, but we decided, you know, we felt like we should go ahead and, and uh, kind of work our way through, through Holy Week with Palm Sunday, with Good Friday, which we might get to talk about uh, and, and Easter. But I, I wanted to ask you kind of, you know, again, we, we went back and forth a little bit just on text and kind of, I think, landed in the same place. But, but what, what was your thinking on just going ahead and, and doing all these things, even though we can't actually meet together and celebrate what really is, you know, such a joyful morning for us? Yeah, I think, um, you know, my thoughts were that either way you go is, is not a, a sinful you know, issue one way or the other. I didn't want to be dogmatic about it. I think you could do that if you wanted to. After all, Easter is is just a date that's been chosen. So you can just change the date on, in a given year if you want. Um, but I think, um, you know, the reason we landed where we did, I think it, in part it's because of who we are as a, as a church. We're not a church that we definitely will, will, have flavors of you know when Christmas rolls around we have decorations and we sing Christmas carols and all of that and I love that and we do the same with Easter and we'll you know we'll we'll sing Easter songs on on Easter morning but we don't we we're a church that that wants to make every Sunday a Sunday that that's so zeroed on being Christ centered and and his birth life death resurrection is implied in every sunday that that it's kind of like hey you know what either way we're we're going to be celebrating that when we when we return mm -hmm. uh together and i think um you know the other a couple of other things i think like when we do get back together it's going to be so celebratory anyway i almost think you're like wasting easter you know like mm -hmm. like to have to save that it's like well my gosh, how much more celebratory is it going to be? I don't care what text. If we're in Leviticus, it's going to be celebratory, uh, just being back together again. And I think right now is, you know, why wait till it's all kind of back to normal to then talk about Christ defeating death in his resurrection and in his, and his cross? Um, why, not, why not emphasize it right now? I mean, I think right now is, a, is, is the best time of all it's like Easter fell in, in a great, in a very opportune time because we're dealing with the realities, the grim realities on, on TV every day of, of death. And so why not have right now be, even though we're not physically together, be the time where we say, guys, let's remember what Jesus did on the cross and in his resurrection to defeat what we're right now seeing, you know? So those were, those are kind of my thoughts. What, what yeah. any, any, anything that you kind of had? 
No, I mean, yeah, I I agree. I think it's a wisdom issue and I can see churches going uh, that direction, but, but I, but I do think, and you made a point too, that, that stuck out to me when we were talking about it. Um, Just that so many churches throughout history haven't even had the the privilege of waiting until, you know, times were better uh, to celebrate Easter because maybe they were in a long stretch of persecution, even now. I mean, I think, you know, there's plenty of churches around the world that, can't really gather at least in safety you know on easter sunday um but they're still going to celebrate easter even if it's in hushed tones yeah uh, because because they want to mark you know the hope of the resurrection and they're not going to wait until their government you know lets them now our circumstances are different and again i don't want to be dogmatic about it either but i do think uh I, i'm glad that we are i think we need the hope of the resurrection right now and and we need to kind of feel the things that, that that go along with even preparing for easter and going through good friday uh and again some churches have come down different one one i heard one i saw one pastor on, on twitter uh he said and again this doesn't like seal it one way or another but but it, it encouraged me he said the most definitive thing about easter this year is the most definitive thing about easter every year uh, it's not about our empty church building. It's about Christ's empty tomb. Um, mm. And just that reminder that, you know, that, that, that is still true. And, and the truth of the resurrection is, is still there. It won't be the same. Uh, I don't think we're going to live stream an egg hunt, you know, for you and I to do uh, and all those, you know, fun thing, the Easter breakfast, you know, just the joy of, of singing uh, those songs very loudly together. We're going to miss it, you know, for sure, oh, um, right. but we'll still celebrate it. So um and then, you know, uh, Good Friday as well. And we're, and we're still working through what we're going to do for Good Friday. We're going to do something, you know, for the church uh, that Friday evening. But one thing we, we are talking about doing and, and do plan on doing is, is joining with our denomination and a few other denominations in a, in a day of uh, fasting. Um, and that uh, we'll talk more about that, I think, next week. And we'll communicate with everybody about, about uh, what that looks like. But that was something that, you know, you and I were talking uh, with with Donna and 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 she brought up you know just feeling you know that need for us to really feel again feel those uh, those those hard things right now in a hard season and, and fasting you know being part of that um, thought it was a great point and glad that along with that the PCA kind of encouraging us uh, as well uh, it's something we've done before as a church family but it's something we'll have the opportunity to do again uh, this Good Friday uh, did you have any thoughts about that or anything to add to that. Um, I, I think, uh, just, you know, what, what you see in, in, in the Psalms, one, one third, I think at least of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. Yeah. And, uh, and I think right now is just a great time because we don't, you know, we, we are, are not used to suffering in, in, in this country. Not, not, not in, in the way that, that people all throughout ch- uh, church history and just history have. And so I think, um, you know, right now is just a, a great time to take these fears, these trials, these struggles, whatever it is we're dealing with right now, um, to the Lord. You know, the, the, the good thing about the lament, the Psalms of lament is that they weren't just, um, these psalmists weren't just rum, running these fears over around and around in their minds, but they were taking them to the Lord in prayer and saying, God, why, why is this happening? Why do I feel this way? Why are you doing this? And, and I think that setting aside that day, Good Friday for, for, for prayer and fasting gives us the opportunity to do that, what, what, what the Bible really uh, models for us. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that's a great point. I, I found an, an old article from an old website uh, called The Resurgence, uh, that it, but it had nine biblical reasons to fast. And I just thought, man, so many of these, they're always applicable, but seems even more so in, in this season. Uh, number one, to strengthen our prayers. Number two, to seek God's guidance. Number three, to express grief, uh, like you just talked about with the Psalms and, and lament. Number four, to, to seek deliverance or protection. We're definitely doing right now. Number five, to express repentance and return to God. Number six, to humble oneself before God. Number seven, to express concern for the work of God. Number eight, to overcome temptation and dedicate yourself to God. And number nine, to express love uh, and worship to God. And there's probably a lot longer of a list that we could yeah. we could even go through. But I thought those nine things were definitely 
good things for us to, to think about, you know, next week. And, and again, we'll talk more about that uh, next week, but I think we're both uh, looking forward to that and looking forward to experiencing that. And again, I think it's something that can kind of bind us together, you know, when we're apart, just knowing that, hey, we're setting this day aside for prayer and fasting and not just off kind of doing our own thing. Uh, and then coming together in one way or another that evening, uh, even online, is, is something that, that's helpful. So um, so one more thing I, I did want to uh, talk about, uh, just since it's applicable to the whole month, is, is our, uh, our new hymn uh, of the month this month. Uh, yeah. And that is a song called uh, Christ, Our Hope in Life and Death. And uh, this is by the Gettys, correct? Um, it's by a host of people. It- yeah, it's it's kind of like Getty music, but okay. kind of like eight different people came together to write that thing. Like Matt Merker, Matt Papa, um, all those guys, like kind of new new writers. Yeah. He, he was one of them, but yeah, it was a bunch of people. Okay, great. Um, and so, you know, you were the one that actually first suggested this song. I think you said Michelle enjoyed this song too, but what, what stuck out to you uh, about this song and, and made you think it was a good a good one for us? Well, it's interesting, uh, just, you know, in thinking about, well, what, what will we choose as our song of the month? Um, it, I, 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 again, just uh, went back to this list that Matt Merker, who is the music uh, guy, kind of music director at Capitol Hill Baptist, had sent out uh, at the beginning of all of this coronavirus stuff, or maybe a week and a half ago or something, he sent out 25 hymns or songs that your church can sing during times of trial. And so I just went back to that list and this was just one of them. And, um, and so I, uh, I just started reading through the lyrics and I don't have them in front of me, but, um, but it really, what I loved about the song is, well, I just think, first of all, the, the tune is great. I love the tune. It's, it's very, um, kind of triumphant sounding but but you know just heartfelt like it just i i think the tune is just something that 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 will that the church will love um it's a modern tune but but really classic but also the lyrics i think as i recall you know it it goes through different stages part of it talks about uh that that the lord holds us in his hands kind of like the sovereignty of god in times of trial there's yeah. part about that but the last section, I think, really um, kind of was, it, it made me well up, you know, with emotion um, when it gets to kind of the final chorus again and the final uh, wording. Do you have it in front of you? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I was going to just yeah build on what you're saying, you know, and I'll, I'll read a couple of the, the lyrics here um, because I love songs, even even like, just non hymn song, not or even non Christians. I love songs that kind of work their way to mm-hmm. kind of a crescendo, you know. And I think that this song, t- I love especially with Christian songs like the movement of the gospel and the the one you were referring to, God holding us. It, it, the, the the lyric says, "Who holds our days within His hand? Uh, who comes? What comes apart from His command? And what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stand." Mm-hmm. And then moving on uh, to the end, uh, unto the grave, what shall we sing? Christ, he lives, Christ, he lives. And what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him. There we will rise to meet the Lord. Then sin and death will be destroyed. And we will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. That's right. Exactly. So just those are those were the, the, the two phrases I was talking about. And, yeah. you know, you just see that in there, like, the first phrase there just encapsulates, hey, what, what, whatever we're dealing with in life comes from his hand and, 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 yeah. and comes from his command. And then, but like the, the end there is, hey, it's all been, not only ha- have our greatest enemies been defeated in Christ's death, but, but one day we will rise to, to be with him forevermore. And it's just such a climax of hope there at the end. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really like it. Uh, yeah. Good, good choice. I totally agree. When I saw it, I was like, Oh, that's, that's really good. So I will look forward to uh, yeah. beginning to learn that uh, together this week. So speaking, speaking of music, this, I've got some music that probably will not bring a tear to your eye unless it's a tear of laughter. Uh, I do want to take a breath in these heavy times uh, to smile a little bit. 
and continue with our trivia challenge. All right. Uh, and Max, uh, as you know, you defeated me in Simpsons <laughs> uh -huh. trivia the first week. I had a huge comeback last week with uh, 80s music trivia. So I stuck, since I'm better at it apparently, I stuck with 80s music this week, but it's a little different. This time I'm gonna read you a lyric and you're, you don't need to give me the artist, but I need the title of the song. All right. Gosh. Okay, uh, so there's, there's 10 of them. Oh, I, I, I once again got eight oh, out man. of 10. So you, all, you always know where you're at, you know, before, yeah. before you begin. And the hard part is saying these lyrics without singing them, like in the tune. So I'm yes. gonna try to just read them straight up. Okay, are, right. you are you ready? I think so, go all ahead. Right. We can dance if we want to. We can leave your friends behind because your friends don't dance. And if they don't dance, well, they're no friends of mine. The safety dance. Correct. One for one. <laughs> oh, these do sound ridiculous when they're not. I know. <laughs> I know. If you want something really trippy, watch watch that video. I don't know what's going on in that, but uh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Number two. It's hard. To, it's hard to read without laughing. <laughs> you wake up late for school, man. You don't want to go. You ask your mom, please, but she still says no. Fight for your right to party. Very good. Two for two, the Beastie Boys. <laughs> yeah. All right. Number three. Harry Truman, Doris Day, Red China, Johnny Ray. We didn't start the fire. Very good. Three for three, Billy Joel. Yeah. All right. It's all the same, only the names will change. Every day, it seems, we're wasting away. Wanted dead or alive. Very good. I did not get that. You are four for four, and you are, I don't know, we're, he we're heading for a, a close one here. You might beat me. Oh, man. All right, number five. When I wake up, well, I know I'm going to be. I'm going to be the man who wakes up next to you. When I go out, well, I know I'm going to be. I'm going to be the man who goes along with you. I would walk 500 miles. Yeah, good. I don't know if that's the title of it. The but. title's I'm going to be, parens, okay. 500 miles. I'll give you that one. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's what I said, too. So you're five okay. for five now. Wow. All right. Turn around. Every now and then, I get a little bit lonely, and you're never coming around. Total eclipse of the heart. Very good. Six for six. This is amazing. This one, I, well, I'll just say it, but I can't believe this is in here. Celebrate good times. Come on. Let's celebrate. Celebrate good times. Come on. Let's celebrate. Celebrate? Celebration. Celebrate. I'll give it to you. Cool yeah. 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 You're good. You're good. All right. So you're yeah. seven for seven. So you just need, if you get two out of these three, you will, you will defeat me. All right. You could go a perfect 10 for 10. I get up in the evening and I ain't got nothing to say. I come home in the morning. I go to bed feeling the same way. I, I, I'm going to kick my, I, I don't know. Dancing I, in the dark. Oh, that's right. I get up in the evening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I could hear it. I could hear it in my, my head, but it was elusive, that one. Oh. All right. So the pressure's on now. Yeah. You should get one of these, I think. All right. I come home in the morning light. My mother says, when are you going to live your life right? Oh, mother dear, we're not the fortunate ones. Girls just want to have fun. Yeah, very good. All right, and this is for the title right here. All right. I got to take a little time, a little time to think things over. I better read between the lines in case I need it when I'm older. I want to, I want to know what love is. Very good. Congratulations, Max. Wow, <laughs> nine out of ten. Well done by Thank you. you. <laughs> yeah, so that's. That's that's really good. I'm I'm looking my wounds and uh, I gotta think of a better. Maybe we'll do Syracuse basketball trivia next oh, week no. so I can get my ego back. <laughs> um, so just just briefly before before we wrap up, wanted to talk a little bit about our our service uh, this week and 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 the passage. And I'll, I'd love to get your quick thoughts on the passage too. Maybe you can help me out a little bit. So I still have some work to do on my on my sermon, but. Um, we talked about, uh, you know, the one song, uh, Christ, Christ, Our Hope in, in Life and Death. Uh, and there'll be some other songs this week that kind of fit with 
uh, Palm Sunday, you know, songs about, about glorifying God. And um, one song that we are singing is All Glory, Laud, and Honor. And I learned that this, this week from a fellow PCA pastor. His name is, do you know this guy, Porter, Porter Harlow? The name rings a bell, but okay. I don't. Okay, I think he's from your old neck of the woods, so it just occurred to me now. Um, but he noted on Twitter this week, and I just noticed it, uh, this year is 1,200 years since that song was written. It was written mm-hmm. in 820 by a person named Theodolf, <laughs> who was the Bishop of Orleans. Wow. And guess where he wrote it from? He wrote it in isolation. <laughs> oh, in prison, maybe? Yeah, he was yeah. in prison. He was protesting uh, the use of icons uh, in wow. the church, which I, I guess was a, a big discussion at the time. And um, and so by himself, uh, you know, in prison, maybe there are other prisoners around, but he certainly wasn't able to be with his, with his church family. Uh, he wrote this song, and I just thought, wow. And I picked that song before I knew that. Uh, and it's one that we've, I think, even sang last year on Palm Sunday. Yeah. Um, but what a neat thing that we can wow. kind of share with somebody from 1,200 yeah. years ago. Not that our situations are the same at all, but but just knowing that that, that he was he was alone uh, when he wrote that is, yeah. is, is something that's really neat. that is neat. Yeah, yeah. So um, so, but other than that, I just you know we only have a, a few minutes. I don't want to go on too long, but I did want to talk about uh, this week's uh, passage, which is Luke. 19, 28 to 44. And we, and we didn't really even talk, Max, but, you know, I guess it, along with doing Palm Sunday and Easter, we said, you know what, let's take uh, a couple of weeks off uh, from John so we can specifically go into passages that talk about Palm Sunday uh, and Easter. And, and again, we didn't feel like we had to do that. There were weeks, there were, have been years where we have just kind of kept going with whatever series uh, that we've been in. But again, I think that that shared experience of of Palm Sunday and Good Friday and Easter, you know, kind of drove us to say, let's let's do some of these more you know familiar passages, uh, and we kind of landed on on Luke. Would you agree? Is that kind of what your thinking was too? Yeah, I think I think that, and and probably plus uh, a little bit of penance for uh, doing Esther at Christmas. <laughs> 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 I have gotten a few people uh complain about that one. So. <laughs> anyway, was, but yeah, yeah, I thought I thought yeah, what well, let's do it. Let let's let's do the classic text. <laughs> and we haven't done Luke yet, so <laughs> That's true. We have not we have not done we have not done Luke yet. So, oh man, bringing up Esther, the ad, the, the classic <laughs> ad, <laughs> Esther's first first ever advent series out of Esther. Yeah. What was the name of the one? <laughs> The one Christmas sermon impaled on his own stake wasn't that one of like that yeah impaled on his own spike or, yeah <laughs> great <laughs> uh, we have a we have a patient church that loves us well don't we <laughs> so good so um well I've got I've got the do you have the passage Max in front of you I or do. You, do? you want me to read it that would be awesome yeah why don't you read it Okay, uh, this is 28 through 44. Yeah, of Luke 19. Okay. It says, and when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage at Bethany, and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to them, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you 
and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I'll share with you just briefly, you know, a couple of my, my thoughts. Yeah. I'd love to hear yours as well. Um, <clears throat> I think this passage is really interesting and it's, you know, I started to look at some, some commentators and a lot of them do treat this whole section kind of, you know, as, as a unit, uh, 28 all the way down through 44. Mm -hmm. Um, and one thing I think is, is interesting is just the different perspectives that you get on Jesus's arrival in Jerusalem. You know, you have the perspective of the, of the disciples and that is a, perspective of, of, of joy, I think, and, and, and excitement for as much as Jesus had told them about what would happen in Jerusalem, you know, I think they're, they're still very excited thinking that this, this is the moment, right, where Jesus is going to uh, really uh, bring, his, bring his kingdom to bear uh, and, set, and set the people free in, in, in every way that maybe they, they, they could imagine. And I think it's just interesting because, you know, we've, we've been in John at the Feast of Tabernacles and Jesus's entrance there being, you know, so much different, just quiet, kind of like almost, you know, snuck into town. And this is a lot different, obviously. And so you have the disciples feeling that and, and Jesus, you know, initiating it as well, you know, saying to go get this colt and he, and he comes in and it's definitely a, a triumphal uh, entry. Um, and then the perspective of, of the Pharisees who, you know, really, just continue to want nothing to uh, do with, with, with Jesus and, and, and dismissing him. But then Jesus's perspective of yes, knowing he, he is coming in uh, to, to, to this city, um, but just the way that he weeps over the city and knowing what's ahead, you know, uh, yeah. uh, that week and knowing what's ahead for these, for these people, which is what he even concentrates on in the midst of his own uh um, anguish, you know, over, over, over what's to come, I think is really, really interesting and really amazing. Uh, just seeing Jesus's compassion, you know, come through here for people that were rejecting him, <laughs> uh, yeah. is really, really something. And so that, that's a little bit, you know, what I've really been thinking about a lot, but any, any thoughts from you, uh, on this passage as well, I would, I would, I would welcome them. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think just, Looking at it right now, uh, off the top of my head, kind of, I, th I think a couple of things that stand out to me is, is one, you have uh, such strong statements of, of Jesus being the Lord again, the Lord God, that, that, who has really kind of planned this whole moment from the beginning of time. Uh, you know, the, even the cult is there, and, and he knows it's going to be there. And when they find the cult it's exactly as he told them it would be and he and then he even says the lord has need of it not not the son of man or or any of these other like jesus of Nazareth, but the lord you know so it's like god the lord god has need of this cult um and and then <clears throat> you know he's he even makes a statement if, if these were silent the very stones would cry out for me you know because i'm the lord of creation and and, and i he have command over even the stones of this earth you know but it's interesting, like, so you've got in that section such strong statements of, of him being the Lord God, all of this being ordained, all this being part of God's plan and all of that. And yet he still weeps over Jerusalem. It's, right. it's not an either or. It's not like because he's entering Jerusalem and even makes strong statements here of, look, the day is going to come when this is going to happen. Like it's been mm -hmm. ordained. Rome is going to come in. Not one stone. He's already talked about that with the temple. Um, or he will talk about that, about the temple, not, not one stone standing upon another. And yet it's not as though he is some, um, you know, cold right. believer in, in God's, uh, in predestination and God's sovereignty. Like, right. well, because, because God's ordained all this, like, I don't even care. I, I'm, I'm completely distant or remote. He still weeps. And he does the same at, at, at the resurrection of Naz I mean, of Lazarus when he knows he's gonna resurrect him uh and and yet even before then he still is so moved uh to tears and to weeping uh at that time so that's one just one of the things that stands out to me that that um it it's it's not it's not one or the other you know for him it's uh 
it's it's he still is is grieving over um the fact that he's been rejected uh, yeah in yeah so. I think that's a great point and I and I think you know and we've even talked about that you know just over the last month of just you know uh not rejecting either uh God's sovereignty or our love and compassion, you know, for, for our neighbors, you know, in the, midst, right. in, in the midst of all this. And, and I think, you know, we definitely see that in a much greater way here, obviously uh, with Jesus. So yeah, those are, those are helpful thoughts. I've, I've got a little ways to go uh, still fr- Friday. Uh, I'm hoping and praying it'll, it'll all come to it. right now. It's Thursday afternoon as we record this. So, um, but yeah, I appreciate your continued prayers and any, any other thoughts that come to your mind, I will welcome them over the next uh, day. It, once I get to Saturday, don't tell me cause it might throw me off. So yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, I know I I'm with you. I, I'm, really, I'm the same way. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I'm, I'm yeah. looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to, uh, experiencing, you know, the empty sanctuary. I, I'll, I'll miss everybody being there. So, yeah. but you'll be there, you'll be there down in the first row, hopefully. And, Yes. I'll probably end up making a lot of eye contact with you since there won't be many other options. So that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> so, well, that's great. Well, is there anything else you wanted to share, Max, or anything? Uh, maybe you could close this in prayer, even if you, if you. Uh, yeah, I'll close this in prayer. I don't okay. have anything else to say. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, man, uh, it's great. Even in the midst of of your work on the sermon, I really appreciate it, and I know the congregation does as well. Well, thanks. I thought it would be a, a confidence boost with the, the music trivia, and now I'm, I got to go, you know, shuffle off and flick my wounds a little bit, but but that's all right. I'll bounce back strong. <laughs> all right. That sounds good. All right. Let's pray. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Lord, how we are so thankful for this time. Uh, I'm thankful for my brother and for uh, just the work that he's put in um, during this time of separation, all of the hard work that he's put into trying to keep us somewhat connected. And Lord, in addition to that, he has the burden of, of the sermon uh, to prepare this week. And I'm thankful that he was uh, still willing to take that on. Uh, but, but Father, uh, we pray that you would just give him a great insight uh, the rest of the day today and tomorrow into this text. And we pray that you would um, strengthen him and give him recall when he's in the pulpit. And Lord, I pray that it would just be a joyful time for him. Um, to to just soak in in your word and uh, Father, thank you for giving us this time to um, to share a little bit of about what's going on um, in our minds uh, relating to the sermons and the services that are coming up. And we pray that this time that that we record now will be a great blessing to uh, this church here in Westchester, this little outpost of of your grace that you've planted here. And we pray for all the church members, Lord, and the regular attenders, Lord. We just pray for this body that we love so much uh, that they would uh, just be refreshed and renewed this Sunday and that you would strengthen them for whatever trials lay ahead. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, brother. Yeah, brother. We, we Thank miss you. It. Yeah. Uh, everybody, we miss you, and we really hope to, yeah. to see you soon. Amen.